In this video, we're going to talk about some basics of people analytics. I'm, we haven't touched on this at all on the channel yet. I'm excited about it. So let's get going right now. I'm Andrea Adams and the host of HR Shop Talk. On the show, you get expert insight into all kinds of things that have to do with HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen, or you can subscribe to the podcast to keep learning from my smart guests. Today, my guest is Alan Hornung. Alan is a director of People Analytics, and an introductory conversation with him uh, helped me realize how much he has to share. Hi, Alan. How are you? Hi, very well. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. And I am looking forward to this. This is my Likewise. first foray into <laughs> people analytics. So uh, first question here, what is people analytics and what's the goal? Yeah, the definition we use is typically the application of science and data to solving um, problems, business problems uh, mm -hmm. to do with people, talent, workforce. And so I think companies have been you know, managing people, working, working with trying to optimize your workforce for a long time, but it's yeah. those two key ingredients of, of data and science, which is really what differentiates people analytics from just general uh, HR professional expertise or, or project work in the past. Right. So building on that, like HR has been running reports on L&D and recruitment and, and we've been trying to pull out data from the system for feels like forever. So what is different about what you do? Yeah, great question. And part of it is that science piece. I think, you know, getting data, data has been around and a part of HR for many, many decades. We've always had HRIS and HCM core systems. Part, part of what you've described, I think, is being able to report on what happened. And that's important. And that's, and that's not going to change. But analytics is more about why did it happen? What's what's going to happen next? Possibly, what should happen? So, kind of that descriptive, predictive, prescriptive analytics maturity model. You you need a good foundation of being able to know what happened, and that comes out of your your transactional systems. But analytics is a lot more, and it turns that into that data into insight and knowledge, and potentially uh, recommended actions. You just talked very quickly about a maturity model. Can you go over that maturity model a bit slower? Sure. Yeah, you bet. So, um, and there's many analytics maturity models and there's people analytics maturity models specifically, but uh, one, one common one is uh, descriptive analytics, which is kind of describing using a report or, or data to tell you what happened. And that's a fact. And that's, you know, from your system of record source of truth, that's descriptive. The next level of analytics would be predictive. So okay. taking that data, applying some sort of, of model or, or prediction algorithm to say, here's what could happen in the future. And that's that's clearly a step above in terms of information value. And then, and then the step after that would be prescriptive. What should you do? And that would be companies that have implemented this, like Netflix's, uh, you know, what to watch next uh, algorithm or Amazon, right? Here's here's what else you should consider buying. Those are the type of things that are, are prescriptive in terms of they're, they're not telling you what might happen, but actually suggesting a, a course of action, either to the decision maker or to the end user. Okay. Can you give me an example of predictive? Probably the most common one in our space and in, in the people analytics space would be flight risk or, or predicting attrition. So, mm -hmm. you know, which you could you could run your employee base through a model and score them on what's the probability or the likelihood that they're going to quit within the next 12 months. And when you do that, it, it doesn't just tell you just the score, but you can actually dig into the reasons and the root causes and say, what are the contributing factors? that Joe may leave, you know, 30% chance of leaving within the next 12 months. And so once you understand those, those drivers, which are based on all the patterns of historical data you feed into the model, you can choose to take action and, and intervene or, or not. But at least then it gives you kind of like a, a early warning system for if you have key people or, or people in a job or a geography that are yeah. more likely to leave. Yeah. And if that's a problem, then, and, you know, management is able to, to, proactively intervene on that. Now you've identified some people who are a flight risk. Prescriptive is going to tell you what you should do about it. That's exactly right. Can you yeah. end on your example there? Yeah, so this this would be more leading. I don't know if many companies have have done this in our space, but that would be if if one of the reasons is, you know, 
in my example, Joe has been in the same level for eight years. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe time to look for a new job or maybe even a promotion. Or mm-hmm. if you can layer in some of your compensation market data, Joe's paid really low to market. You know, an, an 8% increase in pay might actually eliminate the risk altogether. A uh, mm-hmm. 3% increase in pay would reduce it in half, something like that. So okay. basically giving uh, an HR leader or a, or a, a business leader some options and, and rationale why they could take certain actions, which would reduce that risk of, of turnover. Yeah. How much actual human being is involved in that prescriptive stage? It, you could tailor it however you want. I think the best applications of analytics, and, and certainly in some cases, companies have fully fully automated the, the human decision maker out of it, except for extreme cases. So if you think about credit card fraud or underwriting new risks, right? Like you, you can automate that to the point where you don't need a person to approve it. It just kind of happens behind the scenes. I think in our world, in the HR space, it's it's much less than that. You'd, you'd want to be provided options or input, but people are so complicated and hard to predict in the first place. So I think our our models may be less accurate than, than things on consumer behavior. And because of the sensitivity being in the HR department, you'd probably want to just make a decision with the data or the, the model being an input, not kind of the driver of that of that decision. But who knows? I, I think we could be moving more down that spectrum uh, in the coming decades. Right. I just think about prescriptive, what you should do, and, and the data sources that a system would be pulling from. You know, there's so much qualitative stuff. You know, his Joe's supervisor might know A, B, and C, and so I don't know how you put that into a system so that your system can tell you what you should do about that. It, it's a great point about the diversity of data sources and, and probably not everything you need to get good in that lives within like a core HCM. And so mm-hmm. oftentimes you'd look at other sources if you have a separate system to manage performance and succession or mm-hmm. compensation or, or even payroll, uh, engagement surveys, data like that. Um, or or even if, if you're doing kind of like a talent review and like you said, maybe, maybe leaders actually have some really good visibility into you know, who's annoyed, who's frustrated, who's, who's in a really good spot, regardless of what the data says. Mm -hmm. And so you need to incorporate all that. And, and the model, of course, will, will weight it and say what's most important, what's least important based on, on um, historical trends and patterns. If you found this informative, subscribe to see all the episodes and comment. What questions do you have about people analytics? I know I still have a lot, but let us know in the comment section below. So that was a fairly big divergence from where I think to go. But anyway, it was super informative. So um, I have a textbook, uh, an HR textbook that's four years old, and people analytics is nowhere to be found, um, not even in the index. What do you think about this? Why is that? Yeah, not not super surprised to hear that. I think within the last 10 years, maybe even specifically the last five years, it's, it's really grown into its own type of practice. And, and there's been all sorts of recognition that most leading HR groups are trying to invest in, in data and analytics. Mm-hmm. And so I would say 10 years ago, not many companies had like a dedicated practice. Um, five years ago, and for sure today, it's, it's much more common. And so a textbook written four years ago, not surprised to hear that it wouldn't have, uh, you know, a chapter, a topic on that. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it is still kind of a new a new thing for many companies. I think it'll just take some time for the people that write those textbooks, which maybe are ex-practitioners, to catch up with the the state of the art of the of the industry. I think this is a question lots of people are going to have. What tools and resources do you need to do people analytics? Yeah, you you need a couple of things. Um, you need data. Yes. You need data in a in a a way that you can consume it and analyze it, and sometimes that means extracting, transforming it from different source systems into, into one spot. You can kick off a project to kind of create a data lake and that becomes your, your source that you do the analysis off of, but there's all sorts of good off the shelf um, tools and programs that are, are designed for that. They will ingest data from, from different systems and, and model it and stage it in a way that you can just really hit the ground running in terms of analysis. Mm-hmm. So you need data, you need access to data. If you, if you don't have it, you need people. To, to run the analysis. And so that could be a, 
a development opportunity that could be a new hire. There's probably different ways. It could be a transfer in for maybe there's some analytics expertise uh, in the business outside of the HR function. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there's lots of different routes into people analytics, but you would need some someone or, or a small group of people to actually do the work. Uh, and then I think the other maybe more intangible ingredient is a culture and appetite to actually do something with that because sometimes people analytics can produce things that are counterintuitive. Maybe they don't support the prevailing thought on, on whatever the issue is. And so I think you need some fertile ground for it to actually take, take hold because otherwise you can have people generating brilliant analysis and insights, but if they don't go anywhere, if nobody's interested or if it's, if it's focused on something that's not relevant for the business, it's, uh, it's going to die pretty quickly. I have a couple of questions arising out of that. Can you give some examples of tools that are going to, you know, those off the shelf tools that are going to help you with your data? Yeah, so so a big one that we use is is Vizier, and they're great, and that's part of their core value proposition is is taking data from all the different systems that you may have uh, that you would would be relevant for the an analysis, and they will take care of managing it, ingesting it, and and normalizing it, so you can jump straight to. Um, asking questions, asking the data questions in a, in a very user-friendly way. So you don't need data scientists. You don't necessarily need a lot of IT support to build that in-house data lake or data warehouse. You can just outsource that, which is probably makes more sense for smaller to mid-sized companies. What about um, privacy concerns and data cleaning? Yeah, privacy is a, a big one. It's it's probably one of the hottest topics in in my corners uh, of recent years. So you need you need people that are are obviously very experienced with dealing with highly sensitive data because mm -hmm. um, you could you could throw almost anything in there in terms of compensation past performance ratings mm -hmm. maybe even leave of absence type data uh, diversity equity inclusion data there's mm -hmm. there's no shortage of things that you know an analytics team would need access to to properly right. to optimize the value you're going to get yeah what about data cleaning like is, is it helping you with that it does. And, and that takes a lot of the work out. I think years ago, a lot of, of analytics functions probably spent maybe upwards of 80% of their time just getting access to that data, cleaning it, scrubbing it, understanding the, um, the lineage, like where it came from, like the upstream processes that generated that data, and then only 20% on actual analysis. And so there's, there's tools and vendors today that can actually flip that. So you only need to spend 20% of the time getting the data out of the core systems if it's already set up that way. And you can spend the bulk of the time on the analysis, asking questions, pulling on threads, kind of using your creativity to understand what, what the data is telling you versus just getting your hands on it, cleaning it and, and getting it into a usable format. What is an example of some ways you can use people analytics to inform decisions? You've already talked about that a bit, but yeah, maybe you can pull out another example. Yeah, so lots, lots of recent ones, um, you know, cost management, kind of understanding internal org design, spans and layers, mm -hmm. benchmarking externally to, to what a, a good org structure may look like within your industry, I think is, is, a, is a topical one. Mm -hmm. Diversity, equity, inclusion, I mentioned, so kind of understanding yeah. labor market availability and, and representation at a granular level. I think that's another very common uh, analytics topic or, or pay equity modeling. Can I Sorry? that di diversity, equity, and inclusion? You talked about labor market availability. Are you talking about the pipeline and who's in the pipeline? No, not so much. But just if your if your company is setting goals around, you know, we want fifty percent of our workforce to be women. Right. Um, you'd actually have to look at the type of jobs you have in the industry you're into, saying. Are there even 50% of women in the broader talent pool that we're recruiting from to get that? Because right. in, in certain groups, maybe it's IT, right? That may be that may be more challenging than, than jobs like finance or, or legal, where it, it is more gender balanced. Mm -hmm. And so it's just kind of understanding what's what's available in the markets that you operate and compete in uh, in terms of demographics. Mm -hmm. So what do you get that data from? Like that's not data that is in your organization. That's from where? No, that'd be external data. So government sources is a good place to start. So Stats Canada, yep. uh, US Census Bureau type things. Okay. Uh, you can supplement that with, there's typically the big consulting firms would would happily sell you okay. uh, databases or kind of their own their own statistics, right? On on different job types and levels and locations for this kind of thing. So you can you can stitch it together and triangulate from a few different sources 
to get some of that availability data. So what are the most important skills for people who are doing this work? Yeah, so the obvious one is analytical prowess or, or being more quantitatively minded. And I think I think that is important, although I will say in our experience, you don't necessarily need to rush out and hire um, PhD data scientists or statisticians. I think for, for bigger, more mature organizations, that certainly helps. But especially if you're starting out, you really need the right type of, of person, like the person to think in the right kind of way. And for us, that's been more about that intellectual curiosity, just really trying to understand the root cause of problems, mm -hmm. uh, that consulting mindset to really kind of ask, why is this the way it is? And, mm -hmm. and being really uh, savvy at connecting it to the business. So, so going back to the, the core business problems, making it relevant for the business, but just using people data and science to, to answer business problems. So a very, a very strong um, business acumen, uh, blended with familiarity, I would say not necessarily even deep expertise, but familiarity with analytic methods and, and quantitative elements and that creativity to kind of tell the story. Mm -hmm. And so we talked about tools before. There's also good tools out there around data visualization and, mm -hmm. and you can take the data and make, you know, make the picture that's worth a thousand words mm -hmm. in terms of telling that story. Because if you've, if you've got these brilliant insights but you can't communicate them properly, it's it's all for naught. So that, that communication data visualization piece is also critical. Next question here. So when you've done effective people analytics and it's working, how do you know that it's working? Like what are the signs? Yeah, I, I think you you get some good feedback mm -hmm. from from either internally within the HR function or ideally from from the business leaders that you're you're supporting on that problem yeah um it's repeatable it's scalable so if it takes an army just to get to one one great nugget of wisdom yeah. and the leader says that's great now give it to me every quarter for the, yeah. the end of time uh and you haven't set up a process that can scale then that's that's not always successful but if it is something that you can you can do and it's repeatable uh and it's adding value for the business i think that's that's kind of the key for us is making it always relevant to tying it back to the, either the HR strategy or, or the company's corporate strategy to make sure you're focused on solving the, the most important problems. That's how you know you're, you're adding value. So we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about the ability to do the analysis, the ability to be curious, the ability to communicate these nuggets of insight you have. So if someone is not already doing that, where could they learn to do this? Yeah. Luckily, there's so many free or inexpensive resources out there. Like I said, People Analytics has really kind of blown up in the last five, five-ish years. And so places like Coursera or Udemy that you can you can sign up for People Analytics courses. David Green on LinkedIn has a has a new monthly newsletter and digital HR leaders podcast, which is a great way to kind of understand at a high level the landscape. Uh, actually, David Green and Jonathan Farrar just released a book not too long ago, Excellence in People Analytics, and that's mm -hmm. another highly highly recommended resource just to kind of understand the lay of the land and, and how you can, can really get started if it's something you want to do. Right. Okay, well, I'll add links to those in the description of this episode, Perfect. and that hopefully brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks, Alan. So I'm so glad we did that. Uh, I did an episode on the employee value proposition, and that link is right here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.